the 20th century was a century of chaos, producing many figures of prominence. Of course, one of the most representative figures that cannot be avoided is Stalin. Even today, some countries still have mixed opinions about him. Stalin was a member of a minority ethnic group under the rule of Tsarist Russia, a Georgian. You may not be very familiar with Georgia, a country that you may not find on the map. During the 2008 Beijing Olympics, on the opening day of August 8, the then Russian President Medvedev ordered Russian forces to attack South Ossetia in Georgia, forcing Georgia to recognize its independence. There was no choice because you are next to such a fierce and belligerent ethnic group. Throughout history, Georgia has been restless, a place that was contested for centuries by Tsarist Russia and the Ottoman Turks. It wasn't until 1864, the first dozen years of Stalin's life, that this land fully belonged to Tsarist Russia. So when you look at pictures of Stalin, you can see that he doesn't look like the typical Russian with fair hair and blue eyes. If he were to walk the streets today, he would definitely be mistaken for someone who might get beaten up by a group of skinheads. He looks somewhat like people from Western Asia near Turkey. So he is somewhat similar to Napoleon. Napoleon was someone who spoke Italian and had an Italian accent when speaking French, and eventually seized power over the country. Stalin's original name was Joseph Vasarianovich Tugashvili. Stalin is a pseudonym meaning man of steel. His father was a shoemaker who did well in business and was considered a small capitalist in the local area. Before giving birth to him, his parents had three children who all died young. In 1879, the fourth child was born, which was Stalin. So he was the only one left. His parents regarded him as their precious gem, especially his mother, who poured all her love and hopes into little Joseph, wishing for him to grow up quickly. Eight generations of their family were farmers, but his father was fortunate because in 1861, Emperor Alexander II issued an edict abolishing serfdom, freeing the serfs. This allowed their family to prosper and become individual entrepreneurs. This enabled Stalin to afford to study at a theological seminary, a school that only children of relatively prominent people could attend. You needed some money and a few rubles. Having kopecks alone wouldn't suffice. At that time, there was a rule that missionaries could marry. If they couldn't marry, they would all go astray, which wouldn't do. So missionaries could marry, manage a parish, and rise through the ranks. By serving God, you could enjoy a comfortable life that you had never dreamed of before. If a child could become a priest at that time, their parents had something to look forward to. In 1888, when Stalin was nine years old, he attended a church elementary school in a small town called Gori. At that time, his father started drinking heavily. Russian men were known for drinking heavily and not earning money to support their families anymore. He stopped making shoes and spent his days in taverns. This made life difficult for his mother. She had to subsidize the family's expenses and take care of her son by working as a cleaner at the school. At that time, Stalin could only speak Georgian, he didn't know Russian. So his mother had foresight and told her son, you must learn Russian, missionaries must know it and recognize Cyrillic letters. At that time, she also applied for a monthly scholarship of three rubles for her son. In those days, the value of three rubles was very different from today. Today's three rubles might only buy a bottle of drink, but back then, it was already a considerable sum. In addition to his mother earning ten rubles a month as a cleaner, this meager income supported him and his son for five years at school. It can be said that his mother had a very tough life. While accompanying her son's growth, there were two incidents that almost shattered her hopes for her son's success. The first was when Stalin contracted severe smallpox at the age of eight. It wasn't until 80 years later that smallpox was completely eradicated as a disease. Although Stalin was seriously ill, he managed to survive like a little calf and eventually recovered despite leaving scars on his face. Another thing is that Stalin's father opposed his pursuit of a higher future, believing that being a cobbler was also a good job. Stalin's father was a cobbler who insisted that the family should be cobblers for generations. He told his wife that he did not want their son to become a priest or church official. However, around 1889, Stalin's father took him to a shoe factory in Tbilisi, causing a huge controversy in the family. Despite neighbors and his wife persuading that being a clergyman would be more promising, Stalin's father still insisted on his son learning the trade of shoemaking. The following year, Stalin's father was stabbed to death in a drunken brawl, which deeply traumatized Stalin. 
Nevertheless, Stalin returned to school to continue his studies and greatly valued his mother's teachings. Stalin held deep love and respect for his mother, praising her for being intelligent, kind, and upright. After becoming a national leader, he advised his mother to move to Moscow, fearing her loneliness in her later years. However, after living in the Kremlin for a while, his mother found the lifestyle too different and chose to return to Georgia to live her familiar life. It wasn't until 1936 when his mother passed away that her final words to Stalin revealed her regret that her son did not become a priest. However, Stalin had his own thoughts, he believed he had surpassed the position of being a priest. Stalin excelled at the church school, graduating with distinction in 1894 and being recommended to continue his studies at the Tbilisi Theological Seminary. At that time, the seminary had become one of the centers opposing the Tsarist government. In 1885, due to a dean disparaging the Georgian language, students violently treated him and he was eventually exiled to Siberia. By 1890, student strikes due to dissatisfaction led to the closure of the school by the police, resulting in many students being expelled. Despite the strict management of the school when Stalin enrolled, almost turning it into a prison, it did not deter him from pursuing his beliefs and goals. The school rules were extremely strict, students faced confinement in small dark rooms in the basement for minor offenses. Therefore, the persecution of monks, poor food quality, Lack of fresh air and exercise damaged the physical and mental health of many students. This set of rules particularly fueled Stalin's strong resentment. The behavior of the seminary teachers was hypocritical, coupled with Stalin reading many modern books during this period, such as On the Origin of Species, which made him feel that humans were not created by God but evolved from monkeys. These factors turned Stalin into an atheist. Whenever students mentioned God, Stalin would interrupt them, saying it was deceiving us and that there was no God at all. He would lend books to others, telling them that all living beings in this world are very different from what you imagine, and that talk about God is all nonsense. In addition to being interested in political books that enlightened his thinking, Stalin was also interested in folklore. Because Georgian history is full of legendary stories and has left behind a rich literary heritage, he was captivated by Georgia's heroes. One of his favorite books was The Knight in Panther Skin, featuring a warrior wearing a small panther skin, a masterpiece of traditional Georgian literature. The story of Robin Hood-like hero Koba left a deep impression on him. He used Koba as his alias, which later became a name he frequently used. Around 1910, he called himself Koba Stalin. Later, possibly finding this name unpleasant, he changed it to Joseph Vasarianovich Stalin. From 1896 to 1898, Stalin established a Marxist study group in the seminary and became a key leader. In his spare time, he copied books, not various erotic novels, but Das Kapital and The Communist Manifesto. He later proposed organizing related manuscript magazines for the study group, and used these magazines to criticize authoritarian systems, oppression of laborious, and exploitation. Stalin particularly admired Lenin's analysis of the Russian situation, considering it very accurate. In the latter half of the 19th century, the Caucasus region, due to its abundant oil resources, attracted a lot of foreign capital and developed a considerable petrochemical industry. With the establishment of railways and factories in the Caucasus, there emerged a workforce, especially in Baku, a region rich in oil production. This area developed rapidly and became the center of the industrial proletariat in the Caucasus. It was here that the Bolsheviks developed and laid the foundation among the masses. Stalin often engaged in revolutionary activities among workers and students, leading to his expulsion from the institute in 1899. This was a blow to Stalin, but it also made him more liberated, freeing him from institutional constraints. He wholeheartedly devoted himself to a career as a professional revolutionary and became a professional revolutionary. Ideologically, he opposed dictatorship, but deep down, like many opportunistic revolutionaries, it wasn't because he hated dictatorship, but because he resented not being a dictator himself. So after joining the party, Stalin mainly engaged in actions such as expropriation, targeting landlords, redistributing land, robbing banks, hijacking trains, and raising funds for party activities. Once in power, official scholars avoided mentioning that phase of his history to avoid tarnishing the party's image. To climb the ranks within the party, Stalin worked hard to please Lenin. Despite his limited education, he had read many books. 
Such individuals can be quite dangerous as they tend to be self-righteous, especially those who have read extensively in humanities without a background in natural sciences. Stalin had a certain theoretical education and authored several works. Before the October Revolution, he opposed Lenin's armed uprising but later concealed this part of his history, presenting himself as a loyal follower of Lenin. After the October Revolution, with Lenin assuming leadership of the People's Commissariat, Stalin was appointed People's Commissar for Nationalities Affairs, equivalent to the head of the State Ethnic Affairs Commission. Stalin advocated for great Russian chauvinism, leading to severe criticism from Lenin. Lenin criticized him, saying, you are more Russian than the Russians themselves. Aren't you Georgian? Why do you look like a Mongolian? This reflected Stalin's efforts to seek mainstream national identity acceptance due to his feelings of inferiority. He believed that only by completely breaking away from previous groups and even suppressing them harshly could he demonstrate his sincerity. Stalin participated in designing and implementing democratic systems within the party, but did not attain the highest position within it. He advocated for no top positions within the party, leadership collectives should be elected democratically, major decisions should be collectively discussed, and final decisions made through majority voting. Stalin held the position of general secretary for a long time, which in Russian and English is synonymous with secretary. Therefore, referring to Stalin as the general secretary of the Bolshevik party is essentially equivalent to calling him the party secretary general. When he assumed the role of general secretary, he already wielded a certain amount of power. However, his autocratic behavior and deteriorating relationship with Lenin began due to a series of mistakes in his responsibilities, particularly in issues such as the inclusion of Ukraine and other republics into the Soviet Union. Stalin's actions clearly violated principles of national equality and targeted dissenters, which drew opposition from Lenin. In 1922, in Lenin's absence, Stalin passed a resolution to relax foreign trade monopolies, leading to another conflict with Lenin. Lenin annulled the Central Committee's resolution through extensive work. Not only did Stalin clash with Lenin on work-related matters, but his rude and disrespectful personal qualities also became evident, even daring to openly insult Lenin's wife. Krupskaya. Former Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov recalled Stalin saying to him, just because he used the same toilet as Lenin, should I respect him as I respect Lenin? This attitude greatly displeased Lenin. Later on, as Lenin's health deteriorated, he suggested removing Stalin from the position of General Secretary in his will. In mid-December 1922, as Lenin's health worsened, he dictated a letter to the party congress delegates, later known as Lenin's Testament. In this letter, Lenin gave a very negative assessment of Stalin, finding him too rough and deeming this flaw intolerable for someone in the position of general secretary. Therefore, Lenin proposed finding a way to remove Stalin from this position. In fact, Stalin became general secretary in April 1922 without Lenin's proposal. By mid-March 1923, Lenin fell ill and lost his ability to speak and passed away in January 1924. By May 18, Lenin's wife had handed over the batch of letters dictated by Lenin to the Central Committee. However, these letters were not read at the 13th Congress but were read separately to each delegation, and he was forbidden to copy or record the documents, thus minimizing their impact. Under the circumstances at that time, Stalin's control over the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was unstoppable. After Lenin's death, Trotsky was the most popular candidate to succeed him. At that time, there was no highest position within the party. This new type of proletarian democratic politics was not established through personal cults or by eliminating dissent, but through Lenin's democratic style and noble character of uniting and including comrades with different opinions. Trotsky was a person greatly appreciated and trusted by Lenin. Before the October Revolution, after the February Revolution, Lenin was wanted by the provisional government and fled abroad. The uprising was actually led by Trotsky, who was serving as the chairman of the Military Revolutionary Committee. Later, during the civil war to defend the Soviet regime, Trotsky organized the Red Army and was known as the father of the Red Army. If he had any personal ambition, seizing control of the party, government, and military after Lenin's death would have been effortless. If after Lenin's death, the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party had followed Lenin's will and dismissed Stalin from his position as general secretary, Stalin's seizure of control and establishment of a personal dictatorship would not have happened. This model, known as Stalinism, would not have been imposed on all socialist countries, 
ultimately leading to the downfall of the world's first socialist state, the Soviet Union, and the entire international communist movement system. Of course, history cannot be assumed. After Lenin's death, some leaders in high positions in the Soviet Congress and government departments did not want Trotsky to become the new leader of the party and country because of jealousy. This jealousy is the difference between democratic election of leaders and personal appointment of successors. Trotsky came from high society, was well-educated, elegant, talented in writing and speaking, and had a high reputation among the people for his achievements in the revolutionary struggle. Stalin did not match up, he was 163 centimeters tall with a face full of pockmarks. Moreover, before he seized great power, he always appeared humble in front of others, acting as if he was a junior following his seniors. Therefore, the higher-ups felt that letting someone temporarily replace Lenin would give them a chance to take over later. If Trotsky had come to power, everyone else would have paled in comparison. By October 1927, Due to Trotsky's strong opposition to Stalin's dictatorship and advocacy for world revolution, he was expelled from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. After Stalin's Great Purge, Trotsky was exiled and fled to Turkey, France, Norway, and even Mexico. In 1938 in Mexico, with his supporters, he founded the Fourth International, which was a world socialist revolutionary party that stood as an equal to Stalin's common turn or Third International. Stalin could not tolerate this thorn in his side and attempted to assassinate Trotsky several times during his exile. Eventually, in 1940, Trotsky was brutally killed in his own home by Ramon Mercader, who posed as a friend but was actually a Soviet agent, using an ice axe to strike him in the back of his head. Despite being a seasoned revolutionary who had survived many battles, Trotsky died 22 hours after the ice axe penetrated his skull. A great figure passed away peacefully. A Chinese writer once commented on him saying that as a lonely exile without a single soldier or follower, he could still make a dictator who held absolute power tremble with fear. This is where Trotsky's strength lay. In the early 1930s, Stalin had defeated his opponents and was full of ambition having seized great power. As general secretary of the party, it was essential for him to consolidate his power. This began with placing trusted individuals in key departments, commanding the Red Army through Priman Voroshilov, leading the security agencies through Lavrenti Beria, and connecting all achievements to Stalin through propaganda machinery. Thus, a neo-religious cult of personality emerged within the Bolshevik party and throughout the Soviet Union, with Stalin becoming a deity in people's hearts. All achievements were attributed to Stalin because he symbolized the party and state. By December 1929, Stalin celebrated his 50th birthday. The Soviet Union held grand celebrations for this occasion, and newspapers were filled with congratulations for this great, even genius, mentor and leader. Previously defeated opposition figures, such as Kirov, Kaminv, and Bukharin, also participated in praising him. These leaders published articles one after another, admitting their mistakes while extensively discussing how comrade Stalin, the great leader of people worldwide, was correct. It was then they truly realized that the Georgian lad, who used to nod and bow, had such skillful tactics, they regretted not supporting Trotsky earlier. Meanwhile, Stalin's policies increasingly relied on young cadres he selected and promoted, unlike the older generation of Bolsheviks who did not share the same enthusiasm, loyalty, and adoration for Stalin. Thus, Stalin's disdainful attitude towards the old Bolsheviks turned into hatred. He was convinced that those who disagreed or doubted his policies must be removed from the historical stage, believing these individuals to be harmful to the great socialist cause he envisioned. By the 17th Congress of the Communist Party in 1934, a secret alliance formed among the members of the Communist Party's Central Committee Secretariat. It is speculated that at the beginning of the Congress or on its eve, a group of party workers, Politburo members, and Central Committee secretaries had a discussion with Kirov about the necessity to replace Stalin. Judging by the fate of those who participated in this discussion during the purge, Stalin was informed about the content of this conversation through secret channels. For Stalin personally, 1934 was one of the most crucial years in his career. Just as he had defeated his opponents in previous years, he aimed to eliminate and cleanse new enemies including those like Kirov who had once helped him overcome opposition, as they now posed a threat to his rule. At the 17th Congress, Stalin's close comrade Kirov mentioned Stalin 22 times in his speech, 
creating several new terms exclusively for him, such as the helmsman of great socialist construction and the great strategist for the liberation of the working people, even proposing that all arguments and conclusions in Conrad Stalin's report be implemented as party law. These statements were interrupted by enthusiastic applause each time, seemingly leaving no doubt that the entire party was united closely around Conrad Stalin at the core of the party central committee. However, Stalin was not deceived by appearances. He knew that an unprecedented conspiracy against him was gathering behind the applause and eloquent recitations. In this central committee election, Kirov received the fewest negative votes against him, only three, while Stalin received the most, with 292 negative votes. It is said that Politburo member Kaganovich ordered the destruction of this ballot result, announcing that both Stalin and Kirov received three negative votes against them. Thus, Stalin continued as general secretary, with Kirov serving as a Politburo member, central committee secretary, and member of the central organizational bureau. Stalin suggested Kirov come to work in Moscow, but Kirov did not agree. He said, I won't be under your watch, I'll go to Leningrad. Consequently, Kirov became the secretary of the Leningrad Regional Committee. After the 17th Congress, Stalin faced an unprecedented severe political situation. December 1, 1934, was a working day for Kirov and also his last day of life. The nationwide repression campaign began from this day. In the evening, Kirov entered the Smolny Institute where the Leningrad Regional Committee was located and headed towards the office of the second secretary of the Regional Committee. As he paused in the corridor, a bullet struck his neck. He staggered, turned halfway around, and fell headfirst onto the wooden floor. His hat was knocked off partially as blood flowed from the wound. The murderer was a member of the NKVD named Nikolaev, and there is evidence that he had attempted to approach Kirov several times before the murder, but was arrested by the guards. Strangely, not long after, this assassin was released by the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, and Kirov's guards were told not to interfere in the matter and had their party memberships revoked and were threatened. Then, the assassin infiltrated the Smolny Institute again with a weapon and committed the tragic act. Even more bizarrely, at the time of Kirov's assassination, the usually heavily guarded Smolny Institute was empty, without a single guard in sight. As soon as Kirov fell to the ground, a large number of guards appeared as if out of nowhere, suddenly emerging and pinning down the murderer. What's more peculiar is that the head of Kirov's guard was taken away for interrogation in a large truck with a canopy, inside which were several Chika agents armed with iron bars. The Chika was the secret organization of the All-Russian Extraordinary Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution and Sabotage, the predecessor of the KGB. The head of the guard was closely watched by these agents and died not long after. At the time, doctors concluded that he died in a car accident. Some of these Chika agents lived until the 20th Congress of the CPSU during Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin. They stated that the autopsy report was forced and that the head of the guard was killed by heavy iron bars. From the occurrence of this case and throughout the entire investigation process, it can be seen that a powerful hand meticulously orchestrated the event far beyond an act of Nikolaev alone. Therefore, whether or not Stalin ordered this murder, he would use it to the fullest extent to eliminate his opponents. At that time, Kirov's growing national influence, due to his talent made him the second most significant figure in the party after Stalin by 1934, enjoying high prestige. He was independent, talented, skilled at uniting workers, steadfast in his views, and would not echo Stalin's opinions, sometimes even winning a majority vote. Stalin's suspicion and jealousy erupted. A comrade as close as a brother now became a threat to him. Indeed, life also reflects this notion, great favors can turn into great enmities. When you are inferior to me in every aspect, I fully support you because you do not threaten my position. Thus, at the 17th Party Congress, there was brewing support for electing Kirov to replace Stalin as General Secretary of the party, which made Stalin particularly fearful. From this, it is evident that by 1934, Stalin had already transformed the idea of assassinating Kirov into an important step towards establishing his absolute authority within the party and building a total dictatorship. Therefore, he needed to create public opinion and wield his sword against his enemies. After committing atrocities, he executed those who carried out his orders to quell some people's hatred. Thus, he can be considered a paragon of treachery and ruthlessness. Although there is no direct evidence to prove Stalin was the mastermind behind this murder, he fully exploited it, 
turning Tirol's assassination into the spark for the Great Purge, marking the beginning of the Soviet Union's purge campaigns in the 1930s. On the evening of December 1, 1934, following Stalin's suggestion, the Central Executive Committee of the CPSU and the Council of People's Commissars passed a resolution. This resolution mandated amendments to the existing penal codes of the Soviet republics concerning counter-terrorism activities for cases involving terrorist organizations and acts of terrorism against Soviet officials. Investigations could not exceed 10 days. The indictment was to be handed to the defendant the night before the official trial. Neither party would attend the trial nor accept appeals or requests for clemency. Death sentences were to be executed immediately. Essentially, this paved the way legally for later counter-terrorism purges. Ironically, many officials did not realize that by accepting such harsh and arbitrary resolutions, they were digging their own graves. This became Stalin's most powerful weapon in defeating his enemies and purging numerous party officials, because these people had nothing left to protect themselves with. The Ministry of Internal Affairs, commanded by Stalin, could do as it pleased without restraint. Anyone could be labeled an enemy of the people or a member of a conspiratorial group. What if the investigation found no evidence? The investigation period was only 10 days. If evidence was found, the accused would be immediately sentenced to death, and if not, they would still be executed after the deadline. Within the 10-day period, torture could be used to force confessions from the accused, with no right to appeal. Once sentenced to death, the execution was carried out immediately, in a process as smooth and time-efficient as flowing water. Following this, the purge movement was gradually escalated. At that time, one of Stalin's confidants, the Soviet Union's prosecutor General Vyshinsky, privately assured prosecutors not to have any concerns. In a meeting of prosecutorial staff in March 1937, he declared, everyone should remember Comrade Stalin's words, that in the life of a society, in our own lives, there comes a moment when laws become obsolete and should be set aside. He also academically argued that in state crimes, the confession of the accused is the most important and decisive evidence. For this reason, the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs spared no effort in extracting confessions. On December 22, 1934, the Soviet government issued a report on the investigation of Kirov's case, mentioning for the first time a terrorist organization called the Leningrad Center, of which Nikolaev was a member. This organization mainly consisted of members of the Zinoviev and Kaminv opposition. On December 27th, the Soviet government published its conclusion on the accusations against the Leningrad Center, confirming that Kirov's murder was committed by this organization, and stating that assassinating Kirov was part of the organization's long-term plan to assassinate Stalin and other party leaders. After Nikolaev was immediately executed, on January 15, 1935, a trial was held for the main members of the center. Zinoviev and others firmly denied any involvement with Kimov's case. Despite lacking any evidence, the court still sentenced Zinoviev to 10 years in prison and Kamenev to 5 years. Subsequently, the Central Committee of the Communist Party sent secret letters to party organizations nationwide, calling for mobilization of all forces to dig deep into enemies, thus starting widespread arrests across the country and creating countless wrongful cases. The purge lists were an important basis for arrests, Security agencies were responsible for compiling lists of suspects and classifying them according to certain standards. According to materials published at the 20th Congress of the Communist Party, in most cases, these lists were personally reviewed by Stalin or decided by his closest colleagues, such as Molotov, Malenkov, or Voroshilov. From 1935 to early 1936, suppression and arrests did not meet significant resistance domestically or within the party. Although these suppressions caused great unease among some party members, no organized protest actions occurred. This situation emboldened Stalin to implement his purge plan more boldly. As the Great Terror intensified, the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs became an important political department and an instrument of suppression dictatorship. Stalin turned it into a tool of his power and expanded its personnel. At the Central Committee Plenum of the Communist Party in February 1937, Stalin provided a theoretical basis for his suppression and purges. At this plenum, Stalin proposed that a socialist construction in the Soviet Union progressed smoothly, class struggle intensified. He claimed that within the party there were still hidden Japanese and German spies and Trotskyist conspiratorial groups. 
In addition to already existing terms like saboteurs, agents and traitors, a new vague term was added, double dealers. From then on, when executing the party's carders, this term was often used, and large-scale suppression and terror quickly descended upon the heads of the Communist Party and the people. In order to give a legal cover to the Great Purge, from August 19 to 24, 1936, the Supreme Court Military Tribunal of the Soviet Union held its first public trial. The defendants were members of the so-called Trotskyzyn of the United Front. During the trial, the court did not present any evidence, and all charges were based on the confessions and admissions of the defendants. Without legal defense, the confessions of the defendants were used as the basis for conviction. The court finally announced that Zinoviev and others had conspired with Trotsky, who had already been expelled from the country, to murder Kirov, and the charges were established. Sixteen defendants were sentenced to death, executed immediately, and all their properties were confiscated. Less than 24 hours after the verdict, newspapers reported that the executions had been carried out. This trial, which sentenced all defendants to death, led to even larger scale repression afterward. Zinoviev and Kamin were forced into confessions after being severely tortured. Even during the hot summer when Moscow's temperature could reach 36 to 37 degrees Celsius, which might have been particularly hot that year, their cells were heated. Why? To prevent your wounds from healing, letting them fester. Then Stalin sent people to tell Zinoviev and Kamin that as long as they confessed their crimes in court, they and their families would not be killed, meaning their wives and children would be safe. So they confessed, competing in court to admit guilt, you did this, I did it, you didn't do it, I did it, rushing to take the blame upon themselves. After their confessions, indeed, the court banged the gavel, sentencing Zinoviev, Kamin, and the other 14 people to death, to be executed immediately without appeal. The two were dumbfounded, comrades, comrade Stalin didn't say this to us. We want to see comrade Stalin. Pushing outwards, they were loaded onto a prisoner transport vehicle, on their way to the execution ground. The two knocked on the door of the transport vehicle, for the sake of Lenin who has passed away, we want to see comrade Stalin. Upon arriving at the execution ground and seeing that the pits had already been dug, they were shot dead and buried. For God's sake, we want to see Stalin. Two atheists called out for God. After several gunshots, 16 people lay in pools of blood. After their execution, in January 1937, the Supreme Court Military Tribunal of the Soviet Union conducted its second public trial during the anti-revolutionary campaign against the parallel headquarters. These people were once prominent activists of the Bolshevik Soviet state, participants in the October Revolution and the Civil War in Russia. But by the mid-1920s, they were supporters of Trotsky and had been expelled from the party membership. They were already dead tigers. Moreover, by the early 1930s, they had broken off relations with Trotsky and had their party memberships restored. They held leadership positions in publishing institutions of various people's commissariats and other units. However, they were accused of following Trotsky's instructions, betraying their homeland, engaging in espionage and military sabotage work, and carrying out terror and assassination activities. Like in the first public trial, out of 17 defendants, Piatikov and 12 others were sentenced to death. Rodek and three others received sentences of 10 or 8 years in prison. Since Rodek confessed during his trial that he had criminal connections with Bukharin and Rykov, at the end of February 1937, Bukharin and Rykov were arrested while attending a plenary session of the Central Committee. In early March, the Central Committee of the Communist Party held a plenary session where Stalin reported that Trotskyism had become a group of assassins. Saboteurs, spies, and murderers forming a shameless, unprincipled, slanderous gang. They acted according to the tasks of foreign spy agencies. On February 23rd, the Central Committee of the Communist Party announced Bukharin and Rykov's expulsion from the party. By March of the next year, during its third public trial in the anti revolutionary campaign, the Supreme Court Military Tribunal tried Bukharin and 20 other defendants for crimes of assassination and treason. Including Bukharin and Rykov, 19 people were sentenced to death. In the days before his arrest, Bukharin wrote a letter to several leaders of the party, which was not actually intended for the party leaders. Stalin sent someone to Bukharin, telling him that as long as he admitted his crimes, he and his wife would be safe. Bukharin knew all these were Stalin's tactics, but he still said that he would admit all the charges. 
However, he had a few words to say, hoping to see his wife one last time before his death. Stalin agreed to his request. Bukharin wrote a letter to his wife titled, To the Next Generation of Party Leaders of the CPSU. In this letter, Bukharin expressed his concerns about the future of the Soviet Union and his helplessness towards the current political situation. In the letter, Bukharin wrote that he was leaving this world not because of the oppression of the proletariat, but because he felt powerless against an evil machine that used medieval methods, possessed great power, and had the ability to fabricate slanderous accusations. This machine could turn anyone into a traitor, terrorist, assassin, and spy. Even Stalin himself, if doubted, could immediately find evidence against him. Bukharin finally admitted his crimes during interrogation when threatened with the murder of his newborn son. He handed a letter to his wife, telling her to memorize it and then burn it. He told his wife to survive no matter what and to pass the letter on to the next generation of party leaders. After Bukharin's death, his wife, because she was young, managed to survive in Siberia until the 1980s when she made the letter public. The Soviet leader at that time was Gorbachev, and Bukharin was not rehabilitated until 1988. However, by 1991 when the Soviet Union dissolved, rehabilitation seemed irrelevant. The movies about Lenin we have seen, such as Lenin in October and Lenin in 1918, were filmed during Stalin's era, promoting the view that Bukharin was a counter-revolutionary. By the end of 1937, almost all members of the opposition were arrested, regardless of their views. The three public trials were just the tip of the iceberg in deceiving domestic and international public opinion during the purge. In fact, there were far more wrongful cases than those exposed through public trials. The famous Soviet writer Renberg once attended trials against purge victims, and witnessed many defendants being listless and passively responding to interrogation. These people seemed to lose their unique tone and demeanor, leading some to speculate that they might have been drugged or otherwise tortured before confessing. Most of these were revolutionaries who had been through life and death tests. NKVD personnel often drank excessively during interrogations, realizing that today they were interrogating others, but tomorrow it could be their turn. Sometimes, older detainees could be seen comforting younger interrogators, telling them that everyone is equal in the face of suffering. This scene has been repeated more than once in history, not only in the Soviet Union, but also in other countries. Tyrants always abandon those they use. Interestingly, many former officers of Tsarist Russia were also held in Soviet prisons at that time. Because they no longer had any influence, it didn't matter whether they were killed or not, they belonged to the previous regime. A Tsarist general had been in prison for a long time because he refused to compromise with the Bolsheviks. Now the purge mainly targeted those in power, people like him who spend their lives in prison were forgotten and ignored by everyone. He was particularly pleased to see fellow prisoners coming and going every day, saying that compared to Stalin's iron fist, our Tsar Nicholas II was too lenient, which is why he lost his empire. Consider this, from 1825 to 1917, nearly 100 years, Tsarist Russia sentenced a total of 3,700 political prisoners with 625 receiving the death penalty. Lenin had bread to eat in exile and used milk to write secret messages, he had bread and milk and could leave any time. Exile was not imprisonment, people were free and could escape. Stalin escaped from exile four times and even managed to flee abroad. So the general said, compared to Stalin, our Tsar was too lenient, which is why he lost his empire. But if our Tsar were alive today, he would be very pleased because Stalin achieved what he did not. Now prisons are full of Bolsheviks, all these people whom the Tsar most despised. In the nearly 100 years of Tsarist Russia, 625 political prisoners were executed. To this day, there is no exact figure for how many people were killed during the Great Purge. However, as a political repression campaign, its scale, breadth across the state, and depth of harm are unprecedented in history. It marks one of the darkest chapters in Russian history and a significant page in the annals of human wrongdoing. After Stalin's death in 1953, the Soviet Union began to review these cases. In February 1956, Khrushchev reported at the 20th Congress of the CPSU that 7,679 people had been rehabilitated over the past two years, most of whom had already died. Most astonishingly, of the 134 Central Committee members elected at the 1934 Congress, 
which was dubbed the Congress of Victors, 98 were executed, accounting for 70.9% of all members. Nearly all regional party secretaries were executed. Of the 1,190 delegates to the last party congress held during Lenin's era, only 95 survived. The rest were executed. Out of 15 members of the Politburo, 13 were shot, leaving only Stalin and Molotov, all others died. Therefore, after Stalin's death, the CPSU Politburo demanded detailed information from the security departments on the number of counter-revolutionary criminals in custody. In February 1954, the USSR's Attorney General, Minister of Public Security, and Minister of Justice submitted a report to the CPSU Politburo stating that from 1921 to 19. 54, 3.77 million people were sentenced for counter-revolutionary crimes, with 650,000 executed, 2.37 million sent to labor camps, and 770,000 exiled or forcibly relocated. Among all those sentenced, 2.9 million judgments were made by dubious entities such as the OGPU workgroup, special troikas, and special boards, informal institutions. The remaining judgments for less than 900,000 people were made by regular courts, military tribunals, and the Supreme Court. The repression touched every aspect of society. There's a story about Stalin hosting a small gathering at his villa, where Kadanovich, Molotov, or someone else began arguing about constellations in the sky, one said it was Orion, another said Andromeda. Stalin watched with interest as his two lieutenants argued. Finally, Stalin smiled slightly and suggested they simply ask an astronomer from the Soviet National Observatory. The observatory director hurriedly checked which astronomers were still alive, since all but two had been executed, and sent for one. When a car arrived at the astronomer's building late at night, fearing for his life since all his colleagues had been killed and unsure when it would be his turn, he jumped from the sixth floor and died by suicide. When they went to another astronomer's home and identified themselves as from the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs at the door, that astronomer died of a heart attack on the spot. Thus, even the lives of scientists were deemed inconsequential at that time. During the mid-20th century space race between the Soviet Union and the United States, the USSR decided to launch rockets despite a high probability of failure to not fall behind the US. Lavrenti Beria, head of the Soviet Internal Affairs Ministry, took extreme measures by threatening scientists responsible for potential launch failures with execution or life imprisonment. This practice reflected the extreme pressure on scientists from Soviet leadership and their extreme stance on success or failure. However, Beria also mentioned that if the rocket launch succeeded, those sentenced to death would be awarded the Lenin Medal, while those sentenced to life imprisonment would receive the Medal of Hero of Socialist Labor. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1992, the director of the Russian Federal Security Service's Archive Department revealed data on political prisoners from the Soviet era. From 1917 to 1990, a total of 3.85 million people were subjected to various punishments for being accused of counter-revolutionary and state crimes, with 828,000 sentenced to death, though a small portion was later given other sentences. This figure highlights the brutal extent of political repression in the Soviet Union presenting a stark contrast to the sentences handed down during Tsarist Russia as previously mentioned. Between 1937 and 1939, the international situation was extremely tense, with German fascism aggressively invading many countries. For the Soviet Union, this meant facing threats from both Germany and Japan. In this context, Stalin strengthened his control over the Red Army and ordered the NKVD to purge outstanding officers from its ranks. In just three years, tens of thousands of commanders and political commissars loyal to the Communist Party were killed. Stalin's speech at a meeting of Red Army political officers in August 1937 further intensified the purge. Following instructions from Stalin, Soviet Defense Commissar Kriman Voroshilov and NKVD Chief Mikolai Yeshev, a large number of Red Army officers were arrested. Many distinguished Red Army generals were purged during this campaign, including Marshal Mikhail Tukhachevsky, known as the Red Napoleon. Tukhachevsky came from a noble family and served in the Tsarist army before joining the Red Army during the Civil War, where he was praised by Lenin and repeatedly distinguished himself. In 1920, he successfully pursued the Polish interventionist forces to the outskirts of Warsaw. After the Civil War, he was rapidly promoted and was one of the first few generals to be awarded the title of Marshal of the Soviet Union at the age of 35. 
Tukhachevsky's military talent and his tragic fate have become a poignant story in Soviet history. Mikhail Nikolaevich Tukhachevsky was a rare military theorist in the Red Army with a forward-looking strategic vision. He vigorously promoted the modernization of the Red Army, reformed the military system, and pressingly predicted that future wars would be dominated by air and armored forces, advocating for large-scale combined arms operations and deep battle strategies. Tukhachevsky spared no effort in modernizing military equipment, advocating for the mass production of medium and large tanks with main guns larger than 76 mm, laying the foundation for the Soviet Union's ability to produce the renowned T-34 tank and combat the German army. He even envisioned the development of jet fighters, proving himself to be a visionary strategist. Tukhachevsky's enemies, especially Nazi Germany, greatly feared him. Germany planned to completely annihilate the Soviet Union, and Tukhachevsky was one of their primary targets. Before Hitler's plans were fully formulated, turmoil occurred within the Soviet Union. On May 1, 1937, during a parade ceremony next to Lenin's mausoleum in Moscow's Red Square, standing close to Stalin, Tukhachevsky was supposed to travel to England for King George V.I.'s coronation ceremony. However, the Soviet Foreign Ministry suddenly announced that Tukhachevsky could not attend due to illness, and subsequently removed him from his positions as Deputy Defense Commissar and Vice Chairman of the Revolutionary Military Council. This decision shocked the entire military, and Tukhachevsky himself saw it as a great insult. Struck by such a blow, especially as a vigorous soldier, Tukhachevsky was filled with anger and confusion. He even wrote letters to Marshal Voroshilov and Stalin expressing his dissatisfaction with the decision to remove him from his posts, and requesting complete retirement. After persuasion by the chief of the general political department of the army, Tukhachevsky calmed down somewhat and agreed to take up a new position at the Volga military district headquarters. However, shortly before his reassignment, Voroshilov visited him to bid farewell and advised his family to take good care of his pistol and hunting rifle to prevent any extreme actions. On May 30th, when Tukhachevsky was heading to inspect a barracks, he was informed that he needed to report to Moscow and was advised to use a vehicle provided by the secret police. This scene was like something out of a movie. During the drive, his pistol was confiscated by counter-revolutionary personnel. Thus, Tukhachevsky was arrested along with seven other senior officers considered elites of the Soviet army. On June 10th, they began secret interrogations in the basement of the NKVD headquarters. During the interrogation, Tukhachevsky was accused of selling military secrets to Germany, but he vehemently denied the charges and criticized the court. The trial ended in just 20 minutes with a verdict from the judge. Soon after, at the age of 44, Tukhachevsky was executed by firing squad in the basement, ending his legendary but brief life. The tragedy did not end there. Mikhail Nikolaevich Tukhachevsky's daughter-in-law and two brothers were executed, and his three sisters were sent to concentration camps. His underage daughter was also arrested and imprisoned after she came of age. The marshal's mother and sister died in exile. The fake documents that Tukhachevsky was accused of indeed existed, concocted by Nazi Germany. Before occupying Austria and Czechoslovakia, Nazi Germany had conducted special research on Tukhachevsky. Hitler knew better than anyone that in his preparation to annihilate the Soviet Union, this Soviet deputy commander-in-chief, whose strategies were comparable to Napoleon's, would pose a significant obstacle. The best way to deal with a giant is to take off his head. Thus, after repeated planning, all activities were carried out in secret. The Nazis first needed to obtain samples of Tukhachevsky's handwriting because, starting from 1923, the Soviet Union had military cooperation with Germany, such as mutual training of military officers, observing military exercises, and exchanging military intelligence. Moreover, Tukhachevsky and many senior Soviet military officers had studied at German military academies. Later, there was correspondence between officers of the two countries, which was kept in the secret archives of the German General Staff's military intelligence department. However, it was problematic that the German generals at the time were not fully Nazified and did not fully obey Hitler. Hitler's sneaky tactics were despised by the aristocratically born regular German military officers. But this did not deter the Nazis. They secretly dispatched theft experts to infiltrate the secret archives of the military intelligence department of the general staff. In less than two hours, the theft experts had obtained all the correspondence related to Tukhachevsky. 
Then the Nazis began to forge several letters from Marshal Tukhachevsky and his colleagues to senior German military officers, stating, I am preparing to launch a coup and assassinate Stalin, hoping to receive assistance from the German military. In addition to these letters, they also forged copies of replies from German generals to Tukhachevsky and various corroborating documents, even including receipts for large sums of money signed by Tukhachevsky himself. The Gestapo then sold this intelligence, including a letter listing 11 senior Red Army officers as traitors, to a Czechoslovak spy in Berlin. This spy then delivered the letter to Czech President Bene, who forwarded it to Stalin. In reality, this letter was obviously fake to any discerning eye. Why? Because of an oversight by Nazi leader Heydrich, among the 11 named senior Red Army officers were three Jews. It's impossible for Jews to work for Nazi Germany, anyone with normal intelligence could see through the deception. But Stalin chose to believe it. Why? He saw it as an opportunity to purge dissent within the Red Army. He was an amateur military enthusiast who feared his general's disobedience. It is said that the Soviet intelligence department spent 3 million rubles to acquire this intelligence, only for the Gestapo to take these rubles back for testing, which turned out also to be fake. These two dictators had an interesting dynamic, you give me fake intelligence, I give you fake rubles, an unspoken mutual understanding. Besides Marshal Tukhachevsky, Marshals Blacha and Yegorov were also victims. Marshal Blacha was arrested and killed shortly after commanding a victorious battle against the Japanese army at Battle of Lake Kassan. Due to his high prestige within the country and army, Stalin dared not accuse him publicly or even announce his death. Many people still harbored hopeful dreams that he might go to China as an advisor. In 1939, Chiang Kai-shek of China even requested Stalin to send General Galen as a military advisor to China again, only then to receive news that Blucher had been dead for many years. Blucher was severely tortured, one of his eyeballs was beaten out, so when he saw his colleagues, he said, look what these bastards have turned me into. It was not until 1956 that the Soviet government rehabilitated him. Marshal Yegorov was brave when the thugs from the Soviet Union's People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs came to arrest him. The marshal fired his gun in resistance, killing several agents before taking his own life with a gun. He truly had courage, embodying the saying, killing one is enough, killing two, you gain one. During the purge in the Soviet Red Army, 35,000 officers were suppressed, including 80% of senior officers above the rank of colonel, all military district commanders and the majority of army group commanders. Among the first group of five individuals awarded the rank of marshal, three were executed, Blyka, Yegorov, and Tukhachevsky, leaving only Budioni and Voroshilo for survivors. Stalin's two loyal henchmen, one with a large beard but little intellect, who couldn't even understand combat maps and spent his days drinking with Stalin. In this campaign, 13 out of 15 army group commanders were killed, 57 out of 85 corps commanders were killed and 110 out of 159 division commanders were killed, with over 40,000 officers above the company level being persecuted. All this happened on the eve of World War II, significantly impacting the Soviet Red Army's backbone during the subsequent Soviet-German War. Hitler was very pleased with this outcome, reportedly dancing and kissing every lady present to express his excitement. This showed that Hitler's joy was genuine and not an excuse for misconduct. The Soviet Red Army was seen as a headless giant, no longer feared by the outside world. After World War II, Soviet generals recalled that during the Great Purge, 80% of officers above the rank of colonel were killed, a rate far higher than that of senior fascist officers from defeated Germany and Japan. Even the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, the instrument of the Great Purge, was not spared, with its members constantly being replaced to maintain loyalty to the leader or used as scapegoats. The early leader of the purge campaign, Yagoda, was executed in 1936 for failing to meet Stalin's demands, succeeded by Yeshev, who pushed the purge to its climax before being executed himself. Furthermore, during this suppression campaign, thousands of intellectuals from various fields, including historians, biologists, mathematicians, and artists, were persecuted and exiled. Stalin also ordered the execution of hundreds of Ukrainian folk artists because they were living fossils of Ukrainian national culture, with their songs passed down through generations without written records. The famous Soviet composer Shostakovich remarked that every time a folk singer or storyteller was executed, hundreds of great musical works disappeared. 
the Great Purge targeted not only Soviet citizens, but also members of foreign communist parties. Lenin's old comrades, including Platon from Switzerland and Kosciubinski from Poland, were executed, leading to the disintegration of the Polish Communist Party. Communist Party members from Western Ukraine, Eastern Belarus, the Balkans, and the Baltic states were also suppressed. Even Stalin's old friend Yanukovych was executed shortly after expressing his views on the purge to Stalin. However, the Great Purge also resulted in promotions for a significant number of people. Many positions became vacant within the party, government, military, and economic sectors, leading to rapid promotions for many. For example, an engineer named Brezhnev became the secretary of the Dnipropetrovsk State Committee within three years, and later succeeded Khrushchev as the leader of the Soviet Union. A small factory manager named Kosygin became deputy prime minister of the Russian Federation and later served. As prime minister during Brezhnev's era, a shipyard manager named Kuznetsov became commander-in-chief of the Soviet Navy. Therefore, the Great Purge inflicted such heavy losses on the Soviet military that it led to the Soviet Red Army's devastating defeat in the Soviet-German War. A particularly simple example is that with all senior officers executed, it was common to see lieutenants commanding battalions, captains commanding regiments, and majors commanding divisions at the outbreak of the war because all high-ranking officers had been executed. Therefore, after the outbreak of the Soviet-German War, the largest encirclement battle in human history, the Battle of Kiev, took place. In this battle, 700,000 Soviet Red Army soldiers were encircled, and 665,000 were captured, essentially meaning that once these 700,000 men were surrounded, they almost entirely surrendered without resistance. Why did this happen? Because four army groups were encircled, and the commander of the Southwestern Front, General Kurpanos, was just a regiment commander two years prior. In just two short years, he experienced a meteoric rise from regiment commander to division commander, corps commander, army group commander, and finally to front commander. However, his actual command experience was limited to leading a force of one to two thousand men. Although he was a combat hero of the Spanish Civil War and infinitely loyal to Stalin, commanding an army of 700,000 was clearly beyond his capability. Therefore, facing the command of German generals like Hoff and Euderian, Kurpanos found himself overwhelmed. Once encircled, General Kurpanos's first decision was to order the destruction of the front radios and command each army group to break out separately. This immediately resulted in the loss of unified command for the four army groups, leaving the whereabouts of the overall commander and mystery and soldiers to fend for themselves. General Kurpanos managed to break out with his headquarters and guards, totaling just over 1,000 people. This was the scale he could command effectively. When encountering German tanks during the breakout, this brave general charged at them with explosives and was heroically killed. Thus, Kurpanos became the highest-ranking Soviet officer to die on the battlefield during World War II and, in some ways, a victim of a great purge. All right, that concludes our story about the Great Purge in the Soviet Union. But the story of the Soviet Union before World War II is not just about the Great Purge. In our next video, we will explore the Soviet invasion of Finland and the annexation process of the Baltic states.